In this agriculturally themed video, we're going to explore four topics, 5.3 through 5.5 and 5.15, the Green Revolution, impacts of agricultural practices, irrigation methods, and sustainable agriculture. Unlike many other uses for land, agriculture serves a biologically necessary function, the production of food. Agricultural land dominates approximately 50% of all habitable space on Earth. Approximately 12,000 years ago, the agricultural revolution began. The methods and techniques employed by people back then laid the foundation for the development of human civilization as we know it today. Innovations in agricultural practices within the last century has made it possible for the world's farms to produce enough food to feed nearly 10 billion people. But as with virtually all human activities, agricultural practices led to environmental harm and subsequently gives rise to problems that must be dealt with. Shifting from a nomadic lifestyle and relying upon whatever food could be gathered growing wild led to the development of agriculture. Settling in one place where crops could be planted and animals could be raised went hand in hand with artificial selection practices. To improve valuable characteristics in a given species of food crop, people would choose individual plants within that crop to cross-pollinate because of their desirable traits. Repeating this process over many generations would lead to the amplification of those traits in the species. The same intentional artificial selection strategy was used in the domestication of livestock. Keeping and raising animals like sheep, goats, cows, and hogs meant that high protein content meat could be made consistently available to growing human populations. And it is precisely because of the reliable availability of food that populations could grow and small settlements could develop into towns and grow further into cities. For most of the time after the agricultural revolution, the manner in which food was grown and raised remained relatively similar. But beginning in the mid 20th century, advancements and in innovation in agricultural technologies and practices led to a significant increase in global food production. We're going to explore each of the following innovations in more detail. Irrigation, mechanization, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and genetic modification. It is thanks to these types of improvements that has increased food availability, decreased the prevalence of famine, and improved food security for millions of people around the globe. Regardless of crop type, for any area of land to be farmed, water must be available. Irrigation is the diversion and distribution of water that allows land that is naturally arid to be developed for agriculture. California's Central Valley is a superb example of an arid environment with nutrient-rich soil that is able to be exploited for food production thanks to irrigation. That region comprises less than 1% of all farmland in the U.S., yet accounts for nearly 8% of all agricultural output for the entire country, including nearly 40% of all fruits and nuts. Farms select appropriate irrigation techniques based on factors such as cost, how much water is lost due to evaporation and runoff, and the type of crop being irrigated. Furrow irrigation involves plants grown in rows of raised ridges and water flows in between those ridges in trenches. This type of irrigation is relatively inexpensive, but suffers from high evaporative water loss. Crops such as cotton, corn, and sugarcane are particularly well suited to furrow irrigation. Flood irrigation is exactly what it sounds like. Water is released into the field and it simply flows over the ground through the crop. Like furrow irrigation, it is relatively cheap, 
but as you can imagine, suffers from high evaporative water loss as well. However, a second drawback to flood irrigation called waterlogging exists, which we'll take a look at in just a moment. Rice and wheat crops are the most common crops to be flood irrigated. Another type of irrigation, named for exactly how it works, is spray irrigation. Spray irrigation results in significantly less water loss due to evaporation and runoff, but is much more expensive to build and maintain, and requires the use of energy to pump the large volumes of water over the crops. Onion and sunflower crops are regularly irrigated in this fashion. Additionally, corn, cotton, and wheat are also irrigated in this way, assuming the cost of implementing the system can be afforded. The final major type of irrigation is called drip irrigation. This system requires a network of tubes that delivers water directly to the root zone of the plant. Although quite expensive, this method has the benefit of maximizing the efficient use of water and minimizing water loss. Drip irrigation is most suitable for vegetable crops grown in rows, fruit producing trees, and vine crops. Crop irrigation possesses a couple potentially significant drawbacks, salinization and waterlogging. Salinization occurs when small amounts of salts or other dissolved minerals in irrigation water become highly concentrated in the soil as the water evaporates. These minerals and salts can eventually reach toxic levels and prevent plant growth. Water logging happens when soil remains underwater for prolonged periods of time. This impairs root growth because roots cannot get enough oxygen. Since agriculture is the single biggest use of fresh water, underground aquifers are the most important and most widely used in many places as a source for fresh water. Drawing water out of aquifers presents consequences as well. Salt water intrusion is a common problem in coastal areas. When wells are drilled along coastlines and pumping draws out water, that lowers the water table. The decrease in water pressure in the aquifer allows nearby salt water to infiltrate the area, making the water in the wells salty. When more water is withdrawn from an aquifer than enters the aquifer, the water table drops farther below the ground surface. Some shallow wells no longer reach the water table because of the formation of a cone of depression. Essentially, pumping water out of a deep well can cause adjacent, shallower wells to run dry. Using machinery on a farm practically eliminates the need for animal and almost all human labor. Sowing, maintenance, management, and harvesting of crops can be done in much less time. This also improves not only the yield of a crop, but also the profit from the sale of the harvest. Using machinery, however, does require fossil fuels, which increases the carbon footprint of the farm, produces carbon dioxide, and contributes to global climate change. Agriculture removes organic matter and nutrients from the soil, and if they aren't replaced, they can be depleted. For most of all of the history of agricultural practices, soil has been amended and fertilized using organic fertilizers composed mainly of animal manure. Synthetic fertilizers, in contrast, are produced commercially and come with their own set of advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of synthetic fertilizer include the ability to formulate a fertilizer with a specific nutrient content for a given crop. This also means that farmers can rely upon a consistent nutrient content in the fertilizer they apply. Additionally, synthetic fertilizers are far easier to transport and apply than organic fertilizer like manure. But there are drawbacks to synthetic fertilizers. If applied excessively, the potential exists to cause more harm than benefit to plants, as well as the danger of fertilizer runoff. 
Also, the process of manufacturing synthetic fertilizers uses fossil fuel energy. Producing nitrogen fertilizer in particular is an especially energy intensive process. A pest is any undesirable organism in a crop and can include things like rodents, insects, and weeds. Their presence can lead to crop damage, which decreases the farm's output and leads to economic losses. When pest damage is extreme, such as the fungus that ravaged potato crops in Ireland in the mid-1800s, it can trigger a famine. A pesticide is classified based on a few features. The organism it targets, its range of effectiveness, and how long it's effective. Some common categories of pesticides are herbicides, which kill unwanted plants, insecticides, which do the same to insects, fungicides eliminate fungi and mold, rodenticides work against rodents like rats and mice, and avicides, which kill birds. Broad spectrum pesticides are ones that are effective against a variety of pest types whereas selective ones target specific organisms. The broad spectrum insecticide dimethoate, for example, kills almost any kind of insect or mite, whereas the more selective asquinacil targets only mites. Some pesticides are persistent, meaning they remain in the environment for a long time. Others are non-persistent and break down relatively rapidly. Using a persistent pesticide means less need for reapplication, but potential harm to unintended species. Whereas non-persistent pesticides have fewer long-term effects, but they must be applied more often, so their environmental impact is not always lower than that of persistent pesticides. Pest species may evolve resistance to pesticides over time. After a pesticide is applied, Individuals in the pest population that were able to withstand and survive application of the pesticide reproduce, passing on their trait to subsequent generations. As time goes by, pesticide-resistant individuals make up a larger fraction of the population, making the pesticide even less effective and driving the need to develop newer and more powerful pesticides. Persistent substances in particular accumulate in higher concentrations higher up in the food chain. A classic example of a pesticide that bioaccumulates is called DDT. DDT was banned in the U.S. in 1972 in part because it was found to build up over time in the tissues of predators, even though the pesticide was not highly concentrated enough to affect organisms at the bottom of a food chain. For thousands of years, through selective and intentional breeding and pollination, humans have improved the nutritional value and yield of agricultural crops. But in recent decades, utilizing biotechnology, scientists have altered many crop species at the genetic level to grant them new characteristics and traits. The use of genetically modified crops improves crop yield and quality, has the potential to reduce pesticide use, and increases profits for farms. Examples of the traits conferred to genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, include increased shelf life and resistance to bruising, improved nutritional value, drought and frost resistance, as well as greater tolerance to salt content in soil, and pest resistance. Some of the most widely planted crops are genetically modified. 94% of all soybeans planted are GMO. 92% of corn crops are GMO. 93% of canola crops are GMO. Some varieties of potato. Sugar beet crops grown for the commercial production of sugar are 95% GMO and nearly 90% of cotton crops are genetically modified organisms. Although some people are concerned that consuming genetically modified foods are harmful to humans, there is no scientific evidence of threats to human health. However, the use of GMOs does carry with it some disadvantages. 
The use of genetically modified seeds is contributing to loss of genetic diversity among food crops. Also, there are currently no regulations in the United States that require labels on genetically modified foods, which is a hot topic of debate among supporters and opponents of the use of GMOs. The collection of techniques and practices employed by modern agriculture results in environmental damage. Poor agricultural practices can lead to decrease in soil quality and an increase in soil erosion. Along with a prolonged drought in the early 1930s, this is precisely what contributed to what was known as the Dust Bowl. Shifting agriculture involves clearing land and using it for only a few years until the soil is depleted of its nutrients. This method of agriculture sometimes uses a technique called slash and burn, in which forests or jungles, along with other existing vegetation, are cut down and burned to produce ash that is rich in nutrients. However, the availability of these nutrients is short-lived and depleted after only a few years. Synthetic fertilizer can be carried away by runoff into adjacent waterways and aquifers. In surface waters, the availability of excessive nutrients can cause algae and other fast-growing organisms to proliferate, creating toxic algal blooms. Algal blooms can become so large that they can be photographed by satellites in orbit. And after the algal blooms die off, they decompose and reduce oxygen levels in the water killing off species of fish and other aquatic organisms, forming a dead zone. A variety of practices are used in agriculture to prevent excessive soil erosion and preserve soil quality and nutrient content. Windbreaks are linear plantings of trees or other large plants to slow the wind, creating more beneficial conditions for livestock and slowing erosion due to wind. Crop rotation is the practice of planting different crops sequentially in different growing seasons on the same plot of land. This helps to improve soil health, optimize nutrients in the soil, and prevent pest infestations. No-till agriculture is designed to avoid soil degradation. Farmers use this method to leave behind intact root systems holding the soil in place reducing wind and water erosion. It also helps to sequester carbon dioxide in the soil, rather than allowing it to be released into the atmosphere. By plowing and harvesting parallel to the contours of the land, contour plowing helps to conserve soil and prevent erosion by water. Intercropping is a technique in which two or more crop species are planted in the same area at the same time to promote a beneficial interaction between them. For example, a crop which requires relatively high amounts of nitrogen can be planted alongside a crop like legumes that fix nitrogen. Another form of intercropping is called agroforestry. In agroforestry, trees, which themselves can be harvested for their fruit, are planted alongside the main crop because the trees act as windbreaks to reduce erosion. And finally, the use of rotational grazing allows grazing animals like cows to get the nutrients they need while at the same time maintaining the health of the grass and soil over the long term. Under rotational grazing, only a portion of a pasture is grazed at any given time while the other portions are allowed to rest and regrow. That concludes our look into these four agricultural topics. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, take care.